Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing incredibly well. And I hope that you're keeping yourself lovely and warm because the weather's freezing out there. Do let me know what the temperature is where you are in the world. And go and get that lovely, cosy, hot drink. Or if you prefer something a little bit more refreshing, go and get that because I've got a lovely story for you tonight. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, to click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story, shall we? Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, Growing up, I had a tough childhood. Well, tougher than most, I would think. It was just me and my dad, whom I love dearly. I never knew what had actually happened to my mother, as my dad simply refused to talk about her. But when he did choose to broach the subject, he didn't hesitate to use every profanity under the sun to describe her, telling me I was well rid of that whore in my life. Naturally, I wanted to know all about my mother, but I was desperately afraid to ask my dad about her. He would become belligerent and start throwing things around the house like a cantankerous teenager, as if the very name of my mother ruffled his feathers up so much. I knew better than to provoke his pugnacious bellicose mood by asking him awkward questions that he was not prepared to answer. All I had gleaned from him is that my mother had marched out of the house one day, when I was three years old, leaving him a note saying she was never ever coming back. Needless to say, she left me in my father's charge. It was this regrettable revelation that had made me come to the firm presumption that whoever my mother was, I didn't like her anyway. I mean, what kind of a mother leaves their three-year-old daughter under the charge and supervision of their father, and never so much as acknowledges her existence ever again, never even sending her a birthday card? So my birthdays would come and go, and no matter how joyous an occasion they would invariably be, they were always sprinkled with a pepper of sadness and regret. I would secretly ponder if my mother was thinking of me at all, or had she clean forgotten about me. I wanted her to be thinking about me, I rarely did. But another part of me despised her for her apathetic indifference and insouciant dispassion she held towards me. My father was one of those people that was stone-cold sober during the day, but sometimes at night when he returned home, he would have one too many beers. Let's just say he might become intoxicated once in a while. And when he got drunk or inebriated, he would hurl angry accusations at my mother, whom he hadn't seen for many years. I would often wonder why my father hated her so much, that all these years later, whenever he got drunk, he would scream out her name in a frenzied fury, almost as if she had grievously upset him mere minutes ago. I guess that some rivers run deep and the wounds my father carried after that relationship were festering and putrefying like soiled garbage that becomes rank. It was as if the passing of time had only served to exacerbate the hatred he had for my mother. Was time not supposed to be a healer? It certainly wasn't in my father's case. I would ponder if my father was angry with my mother for dumping me on him. Perhaps he felt strangled and choked by my presence in his life for he had never been free to marry again. Was he furious with my mother for not taking on her share of the responsibilities in taking charge over me? I suspected that this might be the case, and the thought saddened my heart, as despite everything, I loved my father very much indeed. In my early years, me and my father moved around from one place to another, which I found increasingly frustrating as no sooner had I begun to make friends in one place and settled down, off we went again, so that we never laid down roots. Imagine a gardener constantly changing the location of a tree he's planting every three months. That tree is going to take one hell of a beating. How can it allow its roots to spread out in the ground comfortably and finally settle? It was like that for us. In those days my father could have potentially been described as having ants in his pants, as we could never stay in one place for very long. It was like we were travelling gypsies, although I'm afraid my father's trap was not desperately exciting or nostalgic like one of those old-fashioned gypsy wagons with their horses. It would invariably be the same old roller coaster again and again and again. I would be the awkward new girl in school. The neighbours' curtains would twitch as they gossiped garrulously about the new folk in town. 
Wherever we went, we felt saliently conspicuous, like pronounced strangers. But then that's exactly what we were, which was never, ever a good feeling. I remember finding it enigmatic and inexplicably baffling that my father would sometimes come home and just say, we're packing up tomorrow and leaving, just like that, without any advance warning. I knew he was serious. His square jaw would tighten. He would run his large hand through his grey hair in such a way that I knew he resolutely meant business. Naturally, I always asked my father why we were moving away again, especially since I'd begun to feel settled and established in a brand new place. He would tell me he'd got tired of it. His feet had grown itchy. I've had enough of this dumb sweetheart. We're moving away, he would say. But Dad, it's not a dump, I would protest. I really, really love it here. I knew that there was no point in arguing with my willful, obstinate father, who was as stubborn as a mule. Persuading him to change his mind would be as easy as persuading a goldfish to swim on dry land. It was never, ever going to happen. So I resigned myself to this reality. I recall thinking we would be better off living in a Winnebago if we were moving around this frequently. I even expressed these feelings to my father, but a Winnebago for him held absolutely no appeal. All this travelling around from one town to another naturally created unnecessary, unwarranted disorder, pandemonium, disruption, upheaval and chaos in my young life, rarely affecting the quality and the standard of my schoolwork. I'd been to over 14 schools in a short space of time, which was ridiculous. My father was a carpenter. His jobs were always cash in hand. As far as I knew, he didn't even have a bank account or a credit card. To all intents of purposes, he would keep a large bag with thousands of dollars in it under our mattress, which I found incredibly useful should I need a spot of cash, for he never counted his money. Suffice to say, my father had very little trouble finding work, so we could pretty much move spontaneously and impulsively anywhere we fancied. The next day he would find gainful employment. On one occasion I attended a phenomenal school, where the teacher there, Miss Caroline Campbell, was just so interested in every one of her pupils. I had never encountered a teacher as intuitive and as inspirational as her. She was one of a kind, like a rose between the thorns. I remember being amazed that she was so focused on me, as all my previous teachers had not really given me a second glance, but this teacher made it her business to learn all she could about me. She appeared somewhat troubled, vexed and perturbed about my flagging grades. And, of course, the fact that I was seriously lagging behind in all my schoolwork. That was a huge botheration for her that warranted investigation. When I told her I'd been to over 14 schools, she looked at me with gog eyes like a goldfish. Are you joking, Lydia? You've been to 14 schools? I remember she crinkled her forehead in perplexment, furrowing her brow curiously. But why so many schools? That's ridiculous. I don't understand. That's crazy. Your father's not running away from the law, is he? She joked. He hasn't robbed a bank, has he? No, I said. None of the above. My dad just gets bored of staying in one place all the time. That's nonsensical, she said to me. It's exceedingly ungracious and inconsiderate of your father, hypothetically speaking, to keep throwing the sails of your lifeboat down a different course all the time. It can be grievously unsettling for a girl your age. How do you feel about all this moving around, Lydia? Does it unsettle you? I don't like it, I said, my eyes suddenly filling with tears. Even I was surprised by my emotional outburst to Mrs. Campbell's question, but it seemed to have hit a soft spot as the tears just rolled down my face like raindrops. Miss Campbell immediately reached for her purse, pulling out several tissues. Now wipe your tears, dear, and have a jolly good blow of your nose. It's very good to cry, dear. It's an emotional release. How about your mother, dear? How does she feel about you moving around to so many places like this? Surely she's not on board with this absurd arrangement. My mother never wanted me, I told her. She abandoned me when I was three years old. Never wanted you, said Miss Campbell, taking me into her arms and ruffling her hands through my hair. I very much doubt that, my dear. I think you've got your wires crossed somewhere down the line. You're a silly little mink, she continued. I'm sure your mother wanted you very much. But grown-ups are very complicated. Things happen along the road. 
So never assume what you think you know is the truth, because the truth can become very twisted and distorted at times. I'll tell you this unequivocally. I'm sure your mother thinks of you very often. She possibly had her good reasons for leaving. Maybe she thought your dad was in a better position to take care of you than she could financially. Maybe she thought he could give you a better start in life. Or maybe she had an emotional breakdown. You don't know. Miss Campbell took my head in her hands and looked into my eyes compassionately. Now you listen to me, Lydia. Don't you ever say your mother never wanted you. You hear me? I'm sure wherever she is, she wanted you. And she loves you very much. And I don't doubt this, that she's thinking about you all the time. You really think so? Of course I do. You think it's true? I said, wiping away more tears. But then why hasn't she ever been in touch? Well, I imagine it can't be easy, said Miss Campbell, when you're moving around so frequently. She probably doesn't even have your address. It can't be easy to trace you if you move around this much. I'd never thought of that. My tears dried up fast. I realised Miss Campbell was right. How would my mother know how to contact me when our address was always changing? It made me feel a whole lot better. Maybe my mother had been looking for me. But how would she ever be able to find me when we were always wandering off to another place? I remember Miss Campbell made a point of visiting my father in the rented house where we were living. It was a relatively bog-standard semi-detached home. Nothing special to write home about. Situated in a pretty tree-lined neighbourhood, with tall imposing honey locust trees fringing either side of the asphalt road. We also had a verdant, perfectly mown front and back yard, with a scattering of trees, along with beds of perennial flowers in season. I'm glad to say that this time the interior rooms in the home had been painted in pretty colours, so it didn't look quite so beige and wishy-washy and mundane as all the former residents had, which had been painted in standard white colours and furnished by someone who lacked any imagination. The house we were currently renting had a private fenced-in backyard and a large mature oak tree with a substantial extended branch where my father had attached my favourite swing. I loved swinging on that tree branch, especially at night when I could hear the croaks of the frogs and crickets and gaze up at the velvety black sky along with the clusters of twinkling stars. I think it was about 7pm in the evening when I opened our front door. I was shocked to see Miss Campbell standing in the doorway. Her timing couldn't have been more perfect, as my father and I had been watching our favourite comedy on television and finished the pizza slices we had ordered. Don't mind me, Lydia, she had said. I need a private word with your father, if I may. Miss Campbell was an attractive woman, with straight blonde hair, who always wore tight black leather skirts above her knees, with tights that had a long black line down the middle, and high patent black shoes, along with glamorous silk shirts. I think my father was rather delighted to open the door to such a glamorous lady, but after her visit to us, he seemed to be running rather scared. I remember sitting on the staircase listening in to their conversation. It was a conversation that certainly got me thinking a whole lot, but my thoughts were rather like hot air balloons flying away in the sky, as they weren't based on solid foundations or intrinsic truths, for I didn't know exactly what to think. Hello, Mr. Joshua. I'm delighted to meet you. I'm Lydia's teacher. My name's Miss Campbell. I'm from the local school. I'm sorry to call on you so late in the evening like this, but I'd appreciate a word with you if I may. Concerning your daughter, Lydia, it's very important. Ah, yes, my father had said. I'm not normally privileged to meet my daughter's teachers. Please do come in, Miss Campbell. Would you like a glass of white wine? Well, I really mustn't, but maybe one glass, but not more than one glass, as I'm driving. Lydia never told me that she had such a glamorous teacher, my father had chided. Well, you may wonder why I'm visiting you, Mr. Joshua. I was, rather. It obviously concerns my daughter. I hope she's behaving herself. Of course she's behaving herself. Your daughter Lydia is a delightful young girl, Mr. Joshua. But it's come to my attention that Lydia has been to over 14 schools. That's an awful lot of schools for a young girl her age. What are you implying, Miss Campbell? My father's voice had boomed. He sounded rather defensive. I'm not implying anything, Mr. Joshua. 
On the contrary, I'm just saying that frequenting so many schools for a 13-year-old girl like your daughter, well, it's not good. It's very unsettling for her. You can see that she can't lay down any solid foundations being yanked from one school to the next. No sooner has she made brand new friends, off she goes again to another school. It's not easy for your daughter. I know children are remarkably resilient, but three new schools in one year, Mr Joshua, that is preposterous. It's not normal. It's exceedingly unfair on your daughter. She was telling me she finds all this moving around very distressing and so destroying And frankly, who can blame her? By all accounts, your daughter is a terribly bright girl. She should be achieving high grades, not the low grades that she's actually achieving now. She should be at the top of her class. It's not her grades that are my chief concern. I'm worried about your daughter's emotional stability with all this chopping and changing in her life. I know she's upset that she hasn't heard from her mother. She emphatically believes her mother never loved her. That's a terrible thing for her to have to think, and I'm sure you agree with that. And I'm also sure it's not true at all. I'm sure her mother loves her very much. Well, it can't be helped if we need to move away. If we need to leave, we need to leave. It's as simple as that. I would appreciate it, Miss Campbell, if you would keep your fat nose out of my daughter's relationship with her mother. It's none of your business. Anyway, her mother wants nothing to do with her. I'm sure that's not true, Mr. Joshua. But in regards to the most significant matter we are discussing tonight, your daughter tells me you get bored staying in one place for an extended period of time. But I hasten to say, Mr. Joshua, when you raise a daughter, it's not all about you. It's about being altruistic, self-sacrificing, raising her unselfishly, giving her a phenomenal childhood where she can lay down solid foundations and a plethora of happy lifetime memories for the school years, Mr Joshua. They're so precious. Your daughter is missing out so much on lifelong friendships and stability is so important for a child like her. All this moving around, it's so disjointing. Miss Campbell, I'll have you know, my daughter has plenty of stability. She's raised in a loving family by a father who loves the bones of her. The fact that her mother sauntered off is not something I can help. I'm sorry to hear that, Mr Joshua. It can't be easy for you. Turbulent relationships never are. But I think it would be wonderful for Lydia to reconnect with her mother. Is there any way you can make this happen for her? I don't know what you think you are, Miss Campbell, involving yourself in the personal affairs of my private life. As I keep telling you, it's none of your business. How I choose to raise my daughter is my business. You're her teacher, Miss Campbell, not her therapist. As for my daughter's relationship with her mother, I keep telling you, it's none of your business. Now there's no need to get so overheated, Mr Joshua. For your information, we're both on exactly the same page, singing exactly the same tune. Two of us have one thing in common. We both want the best for Lydia. I only came to offer you a few pointers, that's all. I thought it would be great for you to comprehend what your daughter is going through, Mr Joshua. She desperately needs stability. It would be so wonderful if you could settle down in one location permanently. That would give her stability, security and love. Those are the ingredients your daughter needs to thrive, Mr Joshua. Thank you, Miss Campbell. You've said your piece. Now I would thank you to go. But you will give what I've discussed some contemplation, Mr Joshua. As I was saying, Miss Campbell, you've said your piece. Now I would like you very much to go. After Miss Campbell had gone, my father had been pacing up and down our home like a caged tiger in a zoo enclosure. He even picked up a vase from the large wooden coffee table, flinging it violently against the wall. Bloody bitch, I heard him saying. Bloody bitch, putting her nose in my business. Who does she think she is? People like her want locking up. Who does she think she is, sauntering into my home like this, thinking she knows what she's talking about? How presumptuous of her. How completely arrogant. I knew my father was really pent up, so I quickly retired to bed, 
feeling very certain my dad was going to drown his sorrows in a six-pack of beers while he watched the sports channel. If he got drunk, it would not be my mother he would be bitching about this time, but the well-meaning Miss Campbell. As I retired to bed that night, it did cause me to reflect on how we were always moving around the place. Maybe my father was running away from something, but what? I couldn't imagine. A day or so passed, and then my father was up to his age-old tricks again. I literally wanted to scream. I knew what this was all about. We were moving again. I could feel it in my guts. My father's square jaw was clenched. He was running his large hands through his hair. We're moving, Lydia. Please, no, Dad. I really love this place. The school here is amazing. I've met so many lovely people here. I really like Anka Marsdale. She's my best friend. And as for Miss Campbell, well, she's the best teacher I've ever had. Well, that's a matter of opinion, my father had said. Your teacher, Miss Campbell, is a very disagreeable woman. Who does she think she is, interfering in our lives like this? So we're leaving because of Miss Campbell, I asked him. No, we're not moving because of your teacher. We're moving because I'm tired of this place. Oh no, I groaned. Please, Dad, I really like it here. I have decided, Lydia dear, that maybe your teacher, Miss Campbell, had a point about us moving around so frequently. So I found a very beguiling place for us to live. A place I think you're going to like very much indeed. In fact, I think you're going to love it. I've been looking at all the pictures of the place. Would you like to see them? No, I said. Dad, I wouldn't like to see them. I told you, I don't want to leave. I like this town. I like the people here. I knew my words had fallen on deaf ears. It would only be a matter of time before we arrived at our new destination. So there we were, out on the open road again, travelling to pastures new. My heart felt downcast, disappointed and despondent. I was in no doubt that this place would be uninspiring. Once again, my father had tired of it. We would move away again. I was sure of it. Although he had assured me that we were going to lay down roots in this new place. But I was filled with cynicism, doubt and scepticism, as my father had never been settled a single day in his life. Still, time would tell whether he would remain true to his word. We were driving past high embankments scattered liberally with trees, down quaint country roads, long forgotten by road repairs for the tarmac that once was a road had forgotten its purpose, as most of it had been taken over by a sea of turf and rambunctious weeds, not afraid to completely monopolise the road with its unruly growth. Unfortunately, the road was not terribly kind to us, as pebbles pelted and pinged against the underbonnet of our truck. Suddenly in my belly, I felt a strange fluttering and stirring of excitement, for we were journeying down rugged, remote countryside, so I soon discerned that we were going somewhere different this time. And indeed we were. We arrived at a farm gate in an area of North Carolina, way off the beaten track, literally in the middle of nowhere. The name on the large cattle gate was Skyfield Heights. We drove past a symmetrical white farmhouse that was as pretty as a picture, with a few barns, stable blocks, meadows where black and bay and grey horses happily frolicked in a field. Finally, we took a neat turning in the road, driving down a gravel path towards a tiny little cottage with a sign that said Ivy Cottage. I gasped in amazement. We were really going to be living here. Are you sure we're going to live here? I asked my father, dancing up and down with an ebullient joy. We are, said my father, taking me into his arms in an affectionate hug. But where is the nearest school? It must be miles away. "'You're not going to school,' my father announced. "'I'm going to homeschool you here at the cottage myself. "'The farmhouse you saw belongs to a farmer "'who's hired me to live on the land and help him on the farm. "'This is his cottage which we are going to live in. "'He says you are very welcome to ride his horses. "'So, yes, we have settled here permanently.' "'Really? That's amazing,' I said.' I had underestimated that word amazing quite considerably, for living in this remote country area, surrounded by viridescent green trees, pretty flowering meadows, rocky outcrops, quaint gravel roads, 
was really a life-changing experience for me and my father. He had befriended the congenial farmer, so I was permitted to ride one of their black and bay horses regularly in the countryside. I felt much more settled in my life, and homeschooling was working very well for me. My father would regularly take weekly trips to the local town to stock up on supplies, and for once the steady pace of life rolled smoothly. I began to feel settled in every area of my life. Several long months went by, and I couldn't remember a time when I was happier. Me and my father were getting on famously, better than we ever had in the past. My father seemed so much more relaxed and carefree, almost as if the weight of the world had been lifted off his shoulders. These days he barely ever got drunk, as the rich sweetness of the country air, along with the general maintenance work he did for the farmer, enabled him to sleep like he'd never slept before. Our health flourished as the stresses of modern life simply withered away, so the two of us were like wild flowers in the valley that blossomed more and more every day, for it seemed that country life nurtured and enveloped us with the wondrous warmth that the natural world embodied. One night, as I was lying fast asleep in my vintage bedroom, I was absolutely certain I'd heard something walking around our cottage. I woke with a start, feeling certain I wasn't mistaken. I'd never known Farmer Paddy to go walking around our cottage at the dead of night. But if it wasn't him, who was it? Farmer Paddy was a slender, willowy man, with a very light walk. But the person walking outside the cottage was definitely much more sizable, as the bipedal footsteps seemed to be rather heavy on the ground. I listened to the thumping sounds, thump, thump, thump. I've always been incredibly curious and inquisitive by nature. I couldn't sit back in my bed without finding out what was going on around our cottage so late at night. I glanced briefly at the clock. It was half past one in the morning, very late. I pushed back the blue and white fleur-de-lis curtains. That was when I saw a dark, shadowy figure darting right past me, gliding swiftly into the woods. I was so astonished that all I could think was, What the hell was that? Imagine someone waving a huge black umbrella past you so fast that you wonder what it is that you saw flashing past your eyes. But you know you saw something. You weren't mistaken. I wasted no time in throwing on a pair of sneakers, along with a thick sweater, and of course my headlamp. I dashed out of the cottage at record speed. Not for a moment did I think of my own personal safety. I was far too impulsive for that. It was not too dark a night, I'm so glad to say. There was a full ivory moon in the sky, casting its silvery shadows over the countryside, dappling everything in an ethereal luminescence, while the twinkling stars bespeckled the sky in tiny clusters of quaint little glittering jewels tucked away in a black velvety ensemble. There was a slight chill in the air as I ran into the woods, while a faint breeze nuzzled my cheeks and blew some of my blonde locks into my eyes which I pulled away from my face, fixing them firmly behind my ears. The tall, towering red maples, oaks and tulip polar trees, with full heads of leafy green boughs, began to jiggle in the wind, while a faint stirring of excitement that I'd first felt when me and my dad had moved here began resurfacing in my guts all over again, almost as if hundreds of monic butterflies were flapping away in my stomach. There was something about the ambience of the night that was evocative, stirring, mysterious, outer-worldly and enigmatic. I'd never known the woods to feel like this before, as even the sounds of the crickets and frogs were strangely absent, so all I could hear was the whistling sound of the wind blowing through the trees, along with the distant howls of a coyote. It was when I entered the woodgrove I could hear the strange chanting sound. It was very peculiar very odd. I slowly moved towards that sound, until it became much louder. I don't know how to explain the chanting sound to you, only it was low-pitched and very deep, almost like some of those um sounds you sometimes hear in meditational mantras. The sounds were very spiritual, deep, very moving. It truly stirred something inside me from a soul level, giving me the strange revelation that there was more to the substance of me than my physical casing. When I got close to the sound, I hid behind a tree trunk, switching off my light, but thankfully no one was paying attention to me. 
but I could see eight creatures with hands linked together in a circle, heads bowed as though deep in prayer, repeating the same words again and again. I remember thinking, who are these beings? As the soft silvery flecks of moonlight cast shadows from the open canopy of the trees onto the creatures' bodies. I could see their outer humanoid silhouettes, but their features were a little fuzzy and blurred. All of a sudden, a large male got to stand up in the middle of the circle. He spoke in a few words in a language I could not comprehend or decipher, but it sounded like an old indigenous ancient language, like the First Nations language. The imposing, impressive creature that stood up was enormous, but also wise and sagacious and old, as if he'd been around for a considerably long period of time. His hair was heavily sprinkled with grey streaks, that I secretly suspected was on account of his advancing years. I was stunned by how tall, wide and sinewy this creature was. I think he was possibly eight foot tall, easily seven hundred pounds or more, from a conservative estimate. All my attention was focused on the creature's human-like face. I don't know how to explain this to you, but this creature looked so wise, like an oracle you might seek out for spiritual guidance and direction as if he had an infinite, all-knowing, unfathomable knowledge about anything and everything. I was transfixed and bedazzled by him, realising immediately that he was a Bigfoot. I beheld a distinctive, vaporous, blue, misty aura whirling around him. It made him look angelic. Everyone seated in that round circle seemed equally as enamoured by what he had to say, as if they were hanging on to his every word as if every word was a precious jewel that was prized, honoured, esteemed, treasured and revered. Even I was mesmerised and in wondrous awe by his words. I didn't have a clue what he was saying, but his words rolled off his tongue like the ocean waves, smooth, crystal clear, authoritative. They grabbed your attention in a poignant way. It would be like if you were shopping in the supermarket. I imagine you always ignore the dull drawl as the background specials are being announced. But imagine you suddenly hear this voice. You hear this powerful, smooth, clear voice. It goes right through you like an invigorating wind. It stirs up your insides in such a poignant way. You stop and ponder. Who was that? Something in you knew that this was no ordinary voice. It was like that. You could be forgiven for believing that this was the voice of God or one of his helper angels. I watched the ceremony for a good twenty minutes until it ended. Everyone bowed their heads and then they got up and glided away, except for the old male whose eyes were firmly fixed on the tree where I was hiding. And then he said, May the Lord go with you, precious child and take you under his wings. And then he nodded at me, and was gone faster than the lightning. It was only after this extraordinary event that I did my research, and learnt more and more about Bigfoot. But this Bigfoot's face was so human, just like yours or mine, with the exception of a very flat nose, and a heavily furrowed brow. None of the creatures looked ape-like, although their heads were pyramid-shaped and their arms overlong. I do not know if this was a coincidence, for I do not believe in coincidences personally, but only a day after my strange encounter with this incredulous beast, I was to meet my mother. Now I ask you, what were the chances of that happening? I remember it was late afternoon, veering towards four o'clock, and a truck drove down our driveway, parking outside of our cottage. I was chopping vegetables in the kitchen at the time. I saw the woman from the kitchen window, with her long black hair swept to one side of her long neck, which looked exotic like one of those Egyptian queens you see in pictures of ancient Egypt. I could imagine her wearing a royal diadem on her head. I noticed her golden-coloured face was very boyish. Her cheeks were full, her forehead sloped broadly, her nose ever so slightly hooked, and her eyes were dark. She was tall and slender, wearing a white dress with a slit up the front. I remember I almost cut my finger, wondering who this exotic woman could be. She slammed the door of her white SUV, 
and walked very purposefully towards our front door. "'Who is that?' said my father, who had been frying onions in a pan on the hob. He glanced out of the window. The colour drained from his face. "'Lydia!' he said to me in a stern voice. "'Go to your bedroom right now. I will get this.' "'But I haven't finished chopping the carrots yet,' I protested. "'Go to your room now, Lydia,' my father ordered me. I went off to my bedroom, but I crept down the stairs and hid behind the curtain in the hallway to hear the conversation in the living room. "'It's been a long time, Veronica,' said my father once he'd opened the door to her. "'I'm amazed you managed to find me.' "'Well, I did, and I have. You have no idea how tough these last few years have been for me, Neville. You think it's all right just to abscond with our daughter, to disappear into the sunset like that? How did you think that made me feel? You broke my heart.' You should have thought about that, Veronica, when you started threatening divorce. Do you think I was going to sit back and let you take Lydia from me? And have some unreasonable judge laying down the law of how many days a week I can see my daughter? No one was going to take my daughter away from me. No one. You're so unreasonable, Neville. Don't you think we could have worked out a plan? "'sat down like two civilised adults, discussed things in a civil way. "'No, I don't, Veronica, because you have never been civil a day in your life. "'Well, more to the point, how is Lydia? I've missed her so much. "'Lydia's doing just fine, thank you very much. "'No thanks to you, I might add. "'No thanks to me? What the hell is that supposed to mean?' It means if you hadn't been so insistent about getting a divorce, nothing like this would have happened in the first place. Oh, there you go again, turning this all around on me, Neville, when you were the one that abducted our child, not the other way round. Oh, please, Veronica, stop being so dramatic. How can I abduct my own child? Because you took her away from me, Neville. Don't you get it? You have no idea how many times I've got this close to finding you. And then you were gone. You were always one step ahead of me. It was so infuriating. So what are you going to do now that you found me? File charges against me? Nothing of the kind. What would be the point? You've already stolen most of my daughter's childhood. She's almost fourteen now. I've missed out on so much. I'm living with a man and I have a seven-year-old boy and a five-year-old. And I think it would be so nice for Lydia to meet her stepbrothers. Thanks to you, I never got married because you never even bothered to sign those divorce papers. Over the years, I've hired dozens of private detectives trying to find Lydia. How did you find me then? asked my father. I don't understand. We're in the middle of nowhere. I've left no paper trail behind me. Even I can't answer that question. That's a conundrum for me as well. The odd thing is I found an envelope in my postbox with all your details, which is why I'm here. But how is that possible? No one knows who I am or where we're staying. Never mind, you've found me now. I'm not going to kick up a fuss, Neville. That would upset Lydia too much. The two of you, I imagine, have a great bond. But I want to get to know my daughter. I feel I have the right. It was at this point I came into the living room. My mother's eyes were fixed on me. Tears began to pour down her face. Lydia, is that you? She cried, dashing into my arms, holding me ever so tightly, while she began to rock me like a baby. You have no idea, sweetheart, how I've longed for this day so very much. I got to a point in my life. I thought this day would never, ever happen that I'd never, ever see you again. I can't believe that it's you, Lydia. So you never wrote a note at three years old and abandoned me? Of course not, dear. You were my world. I've been looking for you for years. Now I've found you. I never want to let you go. To cut a long story short, being reunited with my mother was most certainly the best thing that had ever happened to me and knowing that she had never abandoned me in the first place was so reassuring. I knew she had never stopped loving me, for she had never stopped searching for me. I did forgive my dad for running away with me, 
He was just frightened of losing me. But I'm glad to say me and my mother made up for lost time. I was to discover that I had two stepbrothers whom I love very much. Me and my father stayed at the farmhouse, but I regularly visited my mother and her new family over the weekends. I often wonder how it was that my mother got our address so randomly in the post, literally a day after my Bigfoot encounter. It was like everything in my life lifted after I encountered that anomalous Bigfoot. I often wonder whether the Bigfoots were praying that day. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night. <laughs>